This morning we now open God's Word to Psalm 22, which will also serve as the text for this morning's message. Psalm 22 is the scripture reading and the reading of the text. It has as title, To the Choir Master, According to the Doe of the Dawn, a Psalm of David. This is God's Word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. So far, the reading from God's holy word. So this morning's message is looking at uh, Psalm 22, which I have uh, entitled, Never More Forsaken by God. That's the theme for the message this morning, Never More Forsaken by God. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, David is going back and forth in this psalm from complaint for suffering to trust and praise in God's faithfulness. And in that sense, he truly expresses 
what is true about our lives as well. We can really identify and relate to this kind of experience, spiritual experience, that we go from one moment of complaint for suffering to a moment of rejoicing and thanksgiving and trusting in God. But what is especially wonderful and special about this psalm is that even more, it points to our Lord Jesus Christ, who was in the end forsaken in our place, who stood in that place for us. So that though for a time we must suffer, we shall live eternally with God in paradise, and we will never more be forsaken by God. David, in expressing through song his suffering and persecution, is addressing the experiences that he had being surrounded by his enemies. That he was scorned and despised and mocked and insulted. That he found himself full of fear. That he faced death and execution itself. Verse 15 says, you lay me in the dust, in the dust of death. So great is his suffering that David feels like he has already died, that he has been executed in and for his faith and service to God. And because God allows all things, David can reflect on the fact that God was laying him down in death. He could already taste and feel the grave, as it were. And that's all compressed into those first words of this psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This human experience, as I said already, is something we all experience. And it also describes our children. As fathers and mothers, we recognize this same suffering and complaining because of the brokenness of life in our covenant children. In our baptism form, we also express that as a consequence of sin in the world, that we and our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore by nature children of wrath, so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. In the prayer, we express that praying Our child following God day by day may joyfully bear his cross. Or we pray grant that she comforted in you may one day leave this life which is no more than a constant death. And finally, our children conceived and born in sin are therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation. That is life, that is the reality. And so we confess in the catechism, Lord's Day One, in body and soul, in life and death, there will be turbulent times, there will be difficult situations. Hairs can and do fall from my head. And that's an expression of that the minuteness of daily occurrences are for better or for worse. God is in control of everything that happens to us and all things work together for our salvation, we confess, whether good or bad. And Lord's Day 9 makes reference to a life of sorrow, to adversity that we experience. And so as a realist, David captures not only his, but also the suffering of all people through the ages. He truly expresses the reality of our lives. And as a prophet, David also sings of the suffering that would come upon the Christ, the great Son of God. Of course, David didn't know all the details there, but he knew the promise of a seed that would crush the head of the serpent. This psalm, therefore, finds its greatest fulfillment in the birth, life, death of Jesus Christ when God took on our human nature weakened by sin and yet was without sin. David uses language that especially applies to Christ, 
Look at verse 16. The dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. This psalm indicates how David prophesies of a greater one than he who would suffer crucifixion and curse. And so Psalm 22 is known as the Psalm of the Cross. That Jesus Christ would one day come to live a life of simplicity and suffering that ultimately led to his death, even death on a cross. Through his life, Jesus experienced the wrath of God. He was despised and abhorred so that he would not receive the same because of our sin and distress. In our Lord's Supper form, we acknowledge that from the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth, he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished eternally. That is to say, Jesus Christ was from the very beginning of his life to its very end, surrounded by his enemies and especially by the enemy of sin. He was attacked on every side, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, for us. This psalm anticipates the mockery that Christ received the pain and and the thirst he endured, the piercing of his hands and feet, the casting of lots for his clothes, and most of all, his own cry out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And our form puts it so nicely. Christ is even express that outwardly so that we might know that we will be accepted by God and never more be forsaken by him. Never more forsaken by him. With these words, Jesus teaches that he's the fulfillment of Psalm 22 and that in the end, also Jesus would be laid in the grave in the dust of death. But notice how the psalm concludes. It doesn't conclude in death. What begins with despair actually ends in victory. That Jesus truly conquered sin, death, the devil, and the grave. The verses 22 to 31 are describing that God has not despised his son but has accepted his suffering, and that as a result, the people of all nations will submit to him. At one time, surrounding him as bulls and dogs, as lions and oxen, mocking and disdaining him, now the Christ receives the glory and the honor for his triumphant work. Beloved, the result of Christ's death and resurrection is the eternal life for all of God's chosen ones, those who by his sovereign grace come to faith in the Lord Jesus. Today, therefore, we can rejoice, we can commemorate, we can gather around in festival, indeed not to mock, but to commemorate Christ's death through this bread and wine as symbols of his victory over sin and death. So that in the end, as our psalm also indicates and proclaims the righteousness of Christ in verse 31 when it says, he has done it. You could say, it is finished. So in conclusion, this psalm follows the pattern of many individual complaint psalms in that it begins with a cry for help and concludes in an assurance of deliverance with a promise to fulfill vows. David's situation is a type of the sufferings and resurrection of Christ. And so we too in our own suffering and feeling forsaken can look to the suffering and resurrection of Christ to know 
that Jesus died as the payment for our sin and that his execution on the cross leads not only to his, but to our victory over it. And that too is symbolized in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. So let us this morning, brothers and sisters, indeed eat and drink in remembrance of him. Amen.